Uh, myself and Irma are very excited to be able to present some marketing in information for you all as it relates to government contracting. If you have already been into the trade show floor, you know it's a lot of really great organizations out there, right? So when we think about government contracting, it is absolutely a relation-based transaction. Unless they're desperate for somebody and you have the right, the right price and you're at the right place at the right time, it requires some relationship building and effective marketing. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And you all have worksheets because we will do a little in-class activity. So just real quick to give you a little bit about myself, my name is Christina Wynn. I'm the owner of a company called The Winners Club, and we're a small business development consulting company. So we do workshops and trainings, one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, we really help people to grow their business and then be positioned to access capital because that's what people always say when we ask business owners, what do you need? I need money. So how do we actually prepare ourselves to get funding? Because it does not just come because you want it. So that's what we really focus on. So our services include business development coaching. We do business plan and pitch deck creation. And we're a business brokerage. I'm a licensed business broker, so I help people buy and sell existing businesses as well. All right, so what are the objectives for today? We'll have three objectives. We're gonna go through a capability statement. So the worksheet, worksheet that you all have is a capability statement. I have my actual capability statement on one side and then a blank one. Oh, did you not get one? I just arrived. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And then the other side is blank so that you all, as we go through this activity together, you can actually start jotting down the information that you might put into your own capability statement and obviously you can work on that independently or if you want support, the Winners Club is more than happy to help you with that. We're also gonna talk about your digital collateral. So digital marketing and being visible and having a presence on social media, specifically LinkedIn, when we think about the government is very, very, very important. Like you wouldn't necessarily think about it, but those buyers absolutely do their due diligence when they make a selection. So if we can show up the right way online then that will position us even more to get that opportunity we're also going to talk about your website and your email signatures and how you can optimize those as well as marketing tools to get those opportunities and then lastly we're going to close out with a elevator pitch uh, creation session where we're going to go through our elevator pitches Irma is going to lead that and help you all to create a really good succinct uh, elevator pitch and hopefully we'll be able to get some people to give us examples of their elevator pitches all right, so what is a capability statement? Generally speaking, it's a standard document that introduces your company to procurement professionals. It's a one pager for your business, almost like a resume for your business. And as you're attending in-person and virtual procurement events, or sending out emails to perspectives or prime contractors, it's a great, um, it's, it's greatly recommended that you attach your capability statement because if they're interested in just like the narrative that you're putting in the email and they go and open your attachment, now they're really able to see within a snapshot, do you have what they're looking for? Is it worth them going the next step with you and setting up coffee or a Zoom call to really be able to now talk collaboratively? So now we're gonna get into, I actually have a video here that doesn't look like it's going to pull up. Oh, yes, it is. Maybe not. And it's going to talk you through each component of the worksheet. And I want you all to work on completing. Hmm. Here we go. I want you all to work on completing um, your capability statements. It's the nine building blocks. It's going to have examples. Obviously, mine is on the other side. And then I'm going to take a pause between each building block to see if you all have questions and give you a couple seconds to jot down what information you might put into your own capability statement. Today, we are going to talk about how to write a great capability statement. More specifically, I'm going to share nine building blocks that you can use for any capability statement that you produce. Before we get into the nine building blocks and creating a good capability statement, 
Let's talk about what a capability statement is. It is very similar to a resume and it gives a quick assessment of what you are capable of doing, i.e. the name a capability statement. It also highlights your skills and your track record of success. So now that you understand what it is, a resume for your business, Let's talk about when you would use a capability statement. You would use a capability statement when you are working with buyers at any government agency or corporation, and you wanna give them a quick one page of information that covers everything that is important and relevant about your business. Another example of when you would use a capability statement is when you attend conferences or trade shows of any type. Let's break down those nine building blocks of creating a great capability statement. The first is your company description. So this is going to provide a quick overview of the company's background and you will want to make sure you include the number of years that you've been in business. This is typically a one paragraph summary and again it gives a high level description about the company and the company's background okay so first is the company description and that's going to be on the top left hand side of your sheet here so when you think about the company description you should be able and i'm going to give you all like 30 seconds between each of these you should be able to write into this small section which means that's about two to three sentences max touching on the most important components of your business how long have you been in business? They want to make sure, okay, you've been doing this a little bit of time. This is important to a government buyer. What, what do you all really offer? Your mission can go in there if it's relevant to the audience. So I'm going to give you all a couple seconds um, to either review your current um, company descriptions or jot down some things you might put into your company description. And mine is on the other side if you all haven't flipped it, just if you need like an example of what you might put in there. Okay, we're gonna move to the next one. The second building block of a capability statement is the primary products and services component. This section is also referred to as your company's core competencies. This is where you list your key products and services that you sell. When you think about creating a capability statement, think about who that buyer is and what products and services they care about. So a note for that part, you might have more than one version of your capability statement. I have about five and it totally depends on who the buyer is on the other side. So you tailor this. You don't have to just have one. Another strategy that I want to uh, encourage you all to utilize is Google. If you're in, I know you have a dump truck business because we were talking dump truck business capability statement. Look and see what other people are putting in there to see like, oh, boom, that's something that I do. I want to extract that and put it into mine. Tailor it, create it for what you actually offer, but don't recreate, recreate the wheel. You can always Google other capability statements to get an idea of what you might put into your own. So... Think about those core services that you offer, again, based on who you're talking to, that would be relevant to them. And we'll put that in the core services bucket. Give you all a couple minutes, or a couple seconds to do that. All right, let's go to the next section. So the third building block in creating a great capability statement are codes. I'm gonna go ahead and post a link from the last video that I did. I really break down the different codes that buyers are looking for to identify what product or service that you offer. So make sure you check that video out. You wanna list the codes that potential buyers are looking for. If there is room, you also want to list the description of the code. So for instance, 
your code may be 11705, which is organizational consulting. So if you have enough room, you will want to put the number of the code and also the description of that code. Also, if you have a DUNS number, a state contractor's number, or a bonding number, you will want to include all of those identifiers on your capability statement. The okay. So that's like probably the most important component of the capability statement, in addition to your past performances and contact information, your NAICS codes. So when we're dealing with government buyers or corporations, they are not purchasing your service for, in the example organizational consulting. They are looking at the code that is associated with the product or service that you offer. So when they're doing a quick scan through like, oh, let me see what they do, they're looking for those NAICS codes. So in most instances, like on this example, I did not actually write the descriptive version of my code, but I would absolutely recommend you all to do that, to not only know your next codes and have it on there and the other codes mentioned, but if you can fit it in there and, it, and it's clean, to also put a quick descriptor of what that code stands for. Is everybody already aware of the next codes associated with their products and services? Awesome. Very good. All right. May I ask if sure. codes are really important? Because yeah. in, my, in my private experience, mm -hmm. when I did not deal with any government agencies, no one really looks into my course in any sort except Bank. Yeah. Well, government is super important like is that. For their own statistics? Absolutely. For reporting and for, so, okay, so let me take a step back. So, as a minority or woman owned business, out of, as a veteran owned business, a disabled owned business, an LGBT owned business, you can get certified as that designation, right? And so now, when you look at the government, they have spending goals within their contracts. It might say 10% has to go to a minority owned business. 5% has to go to a woman-owned business. And so when we get certified as small vendors, we're getting certified for the NAICS codes. That's what they're actually certifying you for. So yes, for government contracting, they are very important just to give you some context. Just a point from learning from that, it also helps the bigger firms find you when they're looking for those services. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's just very important. These codes are, are how government agencies are going to identify you and reach out to you. Yeah. So we're, we could be certified, but you're also being certified for the abilities that you have, whether it be uh, selling a product or a service. You're only going to get notifications based on those, uh, those codes. Awesome. Cool. Let's move to the next one. Fourth building block in creating a capability statement is your contact information. Now, although this may be straightforward, of course I need contact information, right? Well, let's talk a little bit more specifically about how you would want to list that out. When you are doing your contact information section, you wanna make sure you specifically are giving your email address as the point of contact. You wanna make sure you are giving your direct phone number and not an 800 number if you have an 800 number. You want them to get directly to you. You also wanna make sure you specify your geographic reach. Is your reach local? Do you have regional reach or do you have nationwide reach or even global reach? And then finally, you wanna make sure you include your website. That'll be really important it shows a level of credibility and reputability in having a website. So you want to make sure you include that in the contact information. The fifth building block of a great capability statement are certifications. So if you are a woman owned, minority owned, veteran owned company, you will want to not only include that descriptively, but if they have a badge, if that certifying agency like the SBA, HUBZone, if they have a badge, you will want to include that on your capability statement as well. The sixth component or building block of a capability statement is your logo. So this is really important for branding purposes. So in creating that brand recognition, you want to include your business logo and your picture as the owner. So it's very important to brand your capability statement. The seventh building block is your statement of capability. This is where you share your value proposition or what makes your company unique. It's important to know that you 
will not be the only option or choice that these buyers have to choose from. So the statement of capability is your opportunity to show how will you make the buyer's job easier? What problems are you solving with your product or service that this organization has? The eighth Okay, I want to take a pause on that one for the capability statement. This is important. The company is, is different from the company description, right? Because that's describing the company. Your capability statement is your blanket statement. This is what we are capable of. If we go back to the methodology of having different capability statements for different type of opportunities, it can be very tailored to the need of the buyer or the person that is looking at that capability statement. So you wanna take some time and think about what your capability statement is. And again, remember, it's okay to tailor it and have multiple versions of that. Okay. I wanna make one more comment about the image. That is more focused on, um, specifically if you're a single member LLC and it's just you, right? It's okay to go ahead and pop that picture on there because that's who they're working with. But if your organization is a bit more established and you have employees and other people that they might be working with, you don't necessarily need to put your picture on there. But for those consultants, again, single member uh, organizations, it's okay to put your picture on there for branding. Okay. Components or building block of a capability statement are your differentiators and competitive advantage. So this is extremely important based on what I shared in the last slide, you will not be the only choice for the buyers. It's important for you to not only tell them how you will help them through the statement of capability, but also talk about things that give you a competitive advantage or that make you different from your competitors. So for instance, being certified as a minority woman-owned business, that is a differentiator. Maybe you have special licensure. Maybe you have special connections or pricing. Think through things that give you a competitive advantage or differentiate you from your competition and you will want to explicitly bullet point those things in your capability statement. The final building block of a great capability statement is past performance. So no, I'm not talking about the dances you used to do when you were a child. We're talking about past performances that are applicable to the capability statement that you are creating. So you want to include two to four statements of proven outcomes. So these are past clients and you want to actually describe what you did with those past clients. And you can also use current clients. But what's most important is that you are putting projects that are applicable to whatever service you are creating this capability statement for. And you want to put the bigger, more impactful performances on your capability statement. All right. So Past performances is another very, very, very important component on your capability statement, if not the most important. So when people, when buyers decide who they are choosing, if, have you ever thought about that? Like how do they decide who they actually go with? They absolutely look at your past performances. If, if this is a project that requires you to have, you know, 30 people working at any given time, you have to be able to produce X amount of inventory, and you've never done that before on that scale, you might not be the best choice for them. You might need to come in as a subcontractor. So when you think about your past performances, you wanna think about what are the largest things that I've done? What are gonna be most um, parallel to what the opportunity looks like? Am I, am, I, am I down here and the opportunity is up here, or can I put things that kind of at least show some capacity and experience so that I could be a viable candidate. So your past performances are very important and as you continue to grow and expand, again, this is a living, breathing document, update those things so it's applicable to the person on the other side. Um, I have a question. So uh, we've been in business for 30 years, um, but on you know, um, the commercial side, we haven't sold or done any RPs. I have been certified for 25 years, like city, state, w, um, e Bank. So if we don't have history in specific government agencies, but we have it in the commercial space, do you get docked, like, you, like if I wanted, I feel like I could be a prime, we're big enough to be a prime, 
how does that work or is it just whatever service we're having to be in professional services? We should just specific, um, let's say they wanted technology resources, we just list, okay, we're with United Airlines and we staffed up 100 people at very specific to whatever they're doing on that RFP. And that's okay. Yeah. So I think it's gonna depend absolutely on the size of the contract. So it's not a, a black and white answer. What I would say is whatever contracts you have done, there can be some parallel, even though it wasn't with the government. You know, the size and capacity, the scope of work can be very similar to the government project. It just didn't happen to be in the government sector. So you would not be deemed in any way for, you know, putting past performances that are not government. Okay. What I would say is, look at so when you look at the rfp and again you really look at the specs and the scope of work and think about okay have we done something that is parallel if it's not parallel but it's in the same like realm maybe the strategy for that particular contract is a subcontractor rather than trying to come in as the prime and just and so now with that even with that subcontract you can update your capability statement now at that point because at that point you've done a, a government contract not as the prime as a sub, but as long but as still, you have done revenue generating work that is of the scale of that contract, absolutely. You, you're they don't deem you for not having prior government experience. It's just in a different industry, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I wouldn't say they wouldn't deem you, but here's what I will say. If there is a another person or business that has the experience the likelihood that they're going to go with the inexperience in government in comparison to the experience is based on that particular buyer. So this is why relationships become important. The diversity, equity, and inclusion person becomes important because they can speak on your behalf. You know, they, they, when they make the decision, um, there is some type of a hierarchy in place. You know, they, they are talking through things, right? So the diversity, equity, inclusion people out there, you want to build a relationship with those folks. They're there to advocate for you. And then they're just, part of the decision making process yes, at the table. That's, that's what they're there for. We're out here meeting these diverse vendors who have the capability. So now we're saying, hey, you need to utilize these diverse vendors who have the capabilities. So where this gets maybe a little complicated is you could have a diversity and inclusion um, professional for CTA and then it's different for trans. Yes. So it's really we're allowed to contact and say these are our capabilities. We're Absolutely. Entitled, we'd like to meet you. Absolutely. And that's so then when they have a bid that goes out and they want a WBE or an MBE. They at least know. It's relational. It's absolutely relational. Because you got to think about it from the buyer's perspective. They, that, that project has to be successful or that's on their head. So they have to have some confidence in who they're utilizing as well. So if you can build that confidence through relationship, through them just staying connected with you, you updating them, hey, we just got this project doing X, Y, and Z. It's not, again, it's not in the government, but it's still a, a large project so that again that confidence and relationship is there when it's decision making time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do you have a statement? Oh yes. What what are your thoughts on adding testimonials to these types of things? Um I don't well I don't know that for a capability so a capability statement I wouldn't necessarily say traditionally has testimonials. I think if it's fitting for like let's say for instance speaking or something like very specific like that, I think it is there's a place for it. But I think the past performances more so um, is giving you the opportunity to show capacity more than they're looking for like what do people think about it, you know? But maybe for again specific industries, it might behoove you to have a, a uh, testimonial in there. Okay, so I got four minutes, and then we pass it to Irma. I just want us to talk about real quick your digital collateral and why this is important. How many of you all follow me on LinkedIn out of curiosity? A fair amount of people, right? Like, we got people in the back too, right? So like, I meet LinkedIn is phenomenal. If you all are not utilizing, when I say social media, we're specifically talking about LinkedIn. You should take, take a day, hire somebody, 
to really go in and take a deep dive to do a refresher on your LinkedIn? How can it be more representative of you as a business owner and your brand? How can you start putting content out there that would be relevant to the audience of folks who are your, your group of people who would purchase your product or service? Social media is so very powerful. People, they are utilizing LinkedIn to try to, again, do a little bit more digging and due diligence about who is this person we're potentially giving this six, seven figure contract to. And, and just networking in general, vertical networking with other people in your industry or adjacent industries. Utilize LinkedIn and let it be representative of your business. Your website as well. So this is going more back into thinking specifically for government contracting. If you're certified, put your badges on your website. I have mine in the footer. So it's always there on every page they go to. Those certification badges are there and they know that we are a certified vendor. We've gone through some type of vetting process, right? We have some type of reputability and credibility, so you want to highlight that. And then your email signature is another great way for you to brand yourself, highlight what you're doing, bring more visibility to what you can offer uh, as far as the government contracting is concerned. So utilize those three um, components of of collateral, digital collateral, to continue to elevate your brand and market your, excuse me, market yourself in government contracting. That is it for me. Does anybody have any questions real quick? Yes. One quick question here. Um, the NDIC code, I am a woman owned is certified and I have an NIGP code. Oh yeah, for the so state of Illinois. Yeah, so should I add the NDIC code as well? Yes, I would. Because are you only certified with the state of Illinois or with other? Yes. Only the state of Illinois. Well, so the state of Illinois specifically only uses NIGP codes. Everyone else uses NAICS codes. So if you're not certified with the other certifying bodies, which means you're really only focusing in on state contracts, I think you're safe with the NIGPs. Okay, but I want to focus on other countries as well. You want to start working with other, okay, so then you need to do the NAICS codes. Okay. Yes. Any? Okay. Is, is there going to be a, a, a slice on the level for this? I would be more than happy to send you all the slides. Um, if you all want to shoot me an email, I, Jackie has them. She may be able to share them. Yeah. 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 Yes. Or leave us your card. Yes. Or leave me your Yes. There you go. Uh, since we are talking about uh, government contracts, mm -hmm. right, uh, do you really think you look at our website, uh, LinkedIn, and all that yes. when, OK, when normally, for example, say, Cook County Hospital, uh, they already have their prime, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now they want the prime to bring on soft. Yes. But the prime, they don't want to give up a dime well. to, to soft. Mm -hmm. Now, the soft is trying to get in, but they bring everything to prevent them from coming in, and they're not meeting their goal. Mm -hmm. What do you do? So the, the cool thing about government contracts specifically now, they are required in order for them to be granted the contracts. They have to have the subs in there unless they just could not find a sub in the category that is there for. And that's why the diversity, equity, and inclusion liaisons, like they're putting things in place. Is it a perfect system? Present day, no. It's better though. So you, you have more, look at how many people are here. I've been to this conference a whole bunch of times. It's never been this many people here. So all I'm saying is you can see the evolution that's happening. So it's not a perfect system yet. But what I can tell you is with, with public contracts specifically, there are spending goals where it literally says X amount of the contract has to go to a minority vendor, X amount has to go to a woman, X amount has to go to a veteran. And then it's up to that prime contractor at that point to find those subs so that they can win the contract. Follow up. That, that's my question. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one that is spending the money should have control over fulfilling the goal that they set. I understand. But the prime is the one that has is the one that is making it impossible for them. So what is it? In your experience, have you identified what seems to be the roadblock for them to enforce? I mean, I had a, 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 a director of procurement. Mm -hmm. You know who introduced me to a prime. Mm -hmm. Say this is somebody that can help you meet your goal. Yes. And they didn't do nothing. Yes. And they still doing the contract. Yes. I mean. So I think the the it's twofold. So they have small business set asides. That's a program that they've implemented 
for that very reason because the control that the crimes have. So there are some instances where you can work directly with the government as a certified vendor. And it's, it's a set it's a set aside program. So only for certified vendors. Crimes can't touch those contracts. So that's one way, I guess, around them having the control. Um, the other side of that is I think it's political in a sense. I mean, I don't know. I'm not the government, so I, I can't really say. But I'm gonna say it's political. That's why they're allowing the primes to make the decision rather than, than they be the one to control who the subs are. But that's just, I have no idea. I just made that up. So don't even, <laughs> I don't know. Can I, I can say something, it, as, as Christina stated, it's not a perfect process. Oftentimes we think the state of Illinois is making these large purchases. They think everything is going hunky-dory. If no one is coming to you know, put these primes in, in their faces and saying, they, they brought me on, they gave me a letter of intent, however, they never utilized it. And then you got the other side where the, the sub won't complain because they're afraid of jeopardizing that, that relationship with the prime, but in, in reality, it's never been a good relationship because they're just using you on paper. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. unless you come to the system and you tell them, this, this large company brought me on board to meet their, their goal, yet they never utilized me. Because keep in mind that the, that large contract is only with the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois is only dealing with the prime. Your contract is with the prime. Mm -hmm. Unless you tell us differently, we think everything's going fine. Another thing that you have to take into account is your payment process. Are you going to get paid upon completion of your job or when, the, when they get paid and how soon after the prime gets paid? So these are a lot of factors you got to take into place, but never <coughs> take for granted something like that, that that's the way it is. Speak your mind, go to these council meetings, and let people know that this is happening. Otherwise, we don't know, because it's not part of the payment process. We don't know if you're, if you're being utilized as they should be. Thank you. I've got a few technical questions. So does it really matter where the entity is registered? Does it have to be in the state of Illinois, or for instance, if there, there's an existing entity in the state of Delaware, would uh, any Illinois or Chicago agencies accept that kind of entity? And also, speaking of payment process, uh, is it paid in arrears upon completion of work, or would any of uh, departments or agencies would be, uh, would be willing to prepay that for any work, or the, the contractor would have to use factoring to, to find out this job, a certain job? I can speak to the BDP program. They certify mm -hmm. businesses throughout the country. So depending on the service or product that you're selling, if you're able, oh, sorry. So the state does business with businesses throughout the country. As long as you're able to provide the goods and services that you're being signed up for, you're good to go. You don't have to be certified. Certification is a benefit that in, um, includes you in these, this goal setting process. But in terms of business in general, because like they said, we government purchases in the billions. Anything and everything that a human being needs to exist, the government buys it. Keep in mind we have the Department of Corrections, we, we um, help children out, we have juvenile, all of that. We have to purchase everything that is going to provide for a good living um, quality. So basically a company registered in Delaware that has presence in, in the state of Illinois uh, can just approach any of those contracts? Yes, and again, it's a registration system. You're, you're registering in these procurement bulletins with the commodity codes that you provide as a service as a, or as a company. Anytime a contract comes up that includes those commodity codes, you get an automatic notification, and then it's up to you to pursue it um, either directly or you start um, fostering these relationships with these larger companies to be considered as a, as a sub. So it, it's, it's a lot of work, it's a, lot, a long process, but if you're passionate enough to do it, you'll find a way and you'll get it. You, you just have to stick with it. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's, um, these events, are absolutely golden because this is where you're going to come across actual decision makers and might be able to come in and speak to somebody, present yourself. And there's nothing like being that person you thought of. Like, I think pharmaceuticals, I think of Wally because I've known Wally for over six years. So um, you want to be the person they think of when um, a certain need is there. And with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Irma Lopez. I am currently under contract with the Illinois uh, Department of um, Human rights, I'm sorry. <laughs> Before this, I retired about two years ago from the state's business enterprise program. I was the outreach manager where we handled certification for the state of Illinois. Um, as such, I've been able to meet great people such as um, Christina. And I think that what adds a lot of value to what we do is our institutional knowledge and being able to pick up the phone 
and talk to certain people, these decision makers, these key um, stakeholders in helping our, our clients and at the same time gathering this knowledge to be able to, to help um, in events such as this one. So let me see if I get this right. So it's often very <laughs> scary to present in front of uh, somebody that you don't know, especially when it comes to your business. You want to uh, put your best face and foot forward and make sure that you're, you're putting out a concise message. You don't want to ruin that opportunity because oftentimes you don't have more than 30 seconds to present what you do, how you do it, and how it is that you're going to solve a problem of theirs. How are you going to satisfy their need of whatever it is that, that, that they have relative to your business? So again, your elevator pitch is 30 seconds. It's a way of introducing yourself, getting across a key uh, point or two, making a connection with someone. It's called an elevator pitch because it should only take the, the amount of time it takes for you to have that elevator ride. So who are you pitching to? You're pitching to potential customers and clients, investors. Keep in mind, if you uh, attended today's uh, keynote speech, I really um, came away with that message that Mr. Uh, was it Baker um, said for about you having to continually, continuously invest in your company because you may be able to provide 100 cupcakes now, but Target needs you to provide 10,000 across three states. So you want to keep investing and be ready for when those opportunities come across. And then you have partners. Your competition is not always just your competition. This may be somebody that you could joint venture with. You may not be able to provide services on a large scale for a, a larger construction project, but if you, um, for example, you have a dump truck and you know somebody that drywalls, those are things that you could joint venture in, make a, a temporary company between each other, and then sell to that prime so they could utilize you on these larger projects. Keep in mind we have these billions of dollars that came in through the federal infrastructure bill, and that's going to affect every single industry that you could possibly think of. So keep your eyes open and be prepared more than anything to jump on these opportunities. Four step elevator pitch. Of course, firm handshake. I'm a very, very firm believer of a firm handshake. I cannot stand the wishy-washy or this. No, no, go in there and, and, and grip. You know, make sure you make it, because they're like, oh, she squeezes hard, I remember her. <laughs> My name is Irma, it's nice to meet you. And then what do we do? I, I am currently a consultant. I like to help women and minority-owned businesses get certification, kind of get their head around them, get, get them to understand the benefits of getting certified. And then uh, explain what you want. I, I, I see that your business has a lot of need for certified vendors. Is there any way that I could come in and consult or, or send me some clients that I could help out to get them on board uh, for you to stay compliant with your contract with the state, city, whatever government entity you're working with? And then finish with a call to action. Can we set up a meeting? Can I give you a call? Can we um, have coffee somewhere? This is where your face-to-face -face engagement is gonna take place, hopefully through a Zoom, if not in person, but at the very least, a call. Um, give them a call. There's nothing like that human interaction, which is very much getting lost nowadays. So when I meet someone and you make an impact, it stays with me and I remember you when the need comes again. Networking, I cannot express how important your networking is. Today is a good example of what you're, how to take advantage of your network. This is where you're gonna make actual connections with, again, key decision makers. This is where you can come and ask someone, for example, procurement. You have to be very careful. Also keep in mind, your conversations with procurement, they are very limited and um, legally bound to only share certain information. You can't go above certain ways. So be careful how you sell yourself. Because if I go in and say I'm a consultant, I do um, certification, and I want to work with you, and then he engages with me in that conversation. If a contract comes up for certification, I can no longer participate in it because there was some prior, you know, exchange in that. So be very um, general, not general, but kind of don't pry too much because there's only so much they could share with you. Take advantage of meeting face to face with these people. You'll get to know a lot of things. Another thing that I came to learn in my experience with the state is the lingo. There's a lot of um, uh, you know, ABDC, you got a M MBDC, WBDC, CMSDC. There's a lot of it. It's very hard to absorb all of it. So if your um, industry is something that is in that alphabetical soup, make sure you explain yourself what you do because it may be common to you, but not to the person you're trying to sell to. 
Today's event is a perfect opportunity. I also help people understand how to navigate an actual conference. Oftentimes when you register for a conference, whether it be free or paid, you're gonna get a map or a program. Go in there and identify who it is I wanna, I'm a construction worker, I'm gonna hit up all these construction workers. I'm a health industry, I'm gonna go to Blue Cross, I'm gonna go Meridian, I'm gonna go to all these different um, health industry providers. I'm gonna hone in on those. And then you go out and have fun and pick up the tchotchkes everywhere else. But you wanna make your time valuable, because again, your time is very valuable. I give you a lot of credit for being here as business owners, because you're not tending your business, you're learning here, but it's still, you're, you're gaining experience. Um, yet your business is still waiting for you, you have a lot of work to do when you get back. <laughs> so bring Brini, plenty of business cards. Um, more and more of us are doing these electronic, and um, like for example, Vince, he had a, um, a QR code, but I still think there's a value of handing something to somebody. I like to go back and either scan them or type them into my contact list or just pick them up you know, I want to call Christina, you know, there's something that I'd like to work with her. Same thing from the exhibitors. Pick up that card from their table or pick up their contact information and send them an, an email. Hi, my name's Irma Lopez. I met you at the Chicago Symposium. I am a consultant. Here is my capability statement. Uh, please keep me in mind should anything come up. The other value in these exchanges, oftentimes we don't take too, into account that a lot of these government agencies have discretionary funds or smaller uh, contracts that don't need to be posted. They may need a $1,000 drywall repair. So they're gonna go into that small business set-aside program, or they're gonna go into the certification list, or they might just cold call you because they, they got your number. So keep those um, opportunities in play, I mean, in, in, in your mind should they come up. Um, one of the things I wanted to clarify, I think that what you were uh, trying to refer in the small set-aside program is a sheltered market. Uh, yeah. Sheltered market was put in place by a few administrations ago, and it, I think right now it covers only marketing and IT. So those sheltered market opportunities are made available only to BEP certified vendors with the state. That's, that's a difference. There is a small business set-aside program that is, uh, does not take, to, take into account ethnicity or gender. You just have to be within a certain size limit to uh, register and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, Again, your capability statement. I give Christine a lot of credit because I hadn't seen such a nice presentation that covered all the basics and, and important factors that you need to uh, include in your capability statement. You don't know how important it is to have it on hand for you to reach out to these larger companies to be considered. And like you said, they stick to that. Don't, don't make it too fancy. Just don't tell them, tell them, you know, I used to dance. In, in the clubs in the 60s or whatever, but um, stick to, the, you want them to know exactly what you do and to what extent. You know, I'm Irma Lopez, I could consult one to 10 people in a workshop, but I'm Irma Lopez, I have 10 employees, I could do a series of workshops in one day, you could hire me for that. So that's your capacity. So you, uh, you put that into your, um, your capability statement. Another thing that I've seen in some really nice capability statement is actual logos of companies that you have provided goods and services to, like Kraft, Motorola, Target, that type of thing. Those stand out because they see that you have an established uh, way of making business and that you have carried across, carried some contracts and delivered satisfactorily. You got your virtual events. Now during COVID, I got Zoomed out, but I did learn a lot. There's workshops, there's training. You got procurement meetings city, state, county, federal, they all do these meetings. Oftentimes you got in, in uh, construction, you have pre-bids. It's very important you attend these pre-bids, pre whether they be in person or virtually. This is where the primes are gonna come out and scope out to see who's, who's wanting to work with them. They still have to tap into the database of certified vendors that the state has, but there's nothing like the value of meeting them face to face, because you could actually engage with them, talk with them, and, and, and have you in mind when the opportunities come up. Virtual networking, again, what I liked about these virtual events, oftentimes they open it up to chat or to questions. Now I'm able to ask the procurement official, you know, this is what I'm doing, can you give me some best practices? Or I've been doing it like this and I don't have any, so he, he might be able to give you some pointers. Maybe you're not providing enough information or you're not using the right format. Keep in mind government is very regulated. If they provide you a template, do not submit something you had on file. Take the time to submit the information as is requested. I was a grant manager at some, play, at some point, and if you so much as gave me an application from last year, it went immediately in the garbage. We could not consider it. 
So those are little tips. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to uh, bring up in one of my networking events when I worked for the state, it was just a, a number of vendors and some large agencies. Before I know it, the end of the, the event, a uh, battery vendor came to me and thanked me for bringing him to this event because he signed a $5,000 contract with a fellow vendor, not the agency, not a, but right there he walked away with an order for $5,000 in batteries. So place value in all these networking opportunities. They may not be useful to you today, but you never know what you're going to do tomorrow or who might call you tomorrow for potential um, opportunities. Again, my name is Irma Lopez. I am currently under contract with the Illinois Department of uh, Human Rights. But uh, more importantly, my experience comes from 30 years in government, um, primarily with the certification process. And I think what uh, Christine and I bring, our, our biggest value is our network and our institutional knowledge and being able to pick up the phone and call someone on your behalf. So keep us in mind should we be able to help you out. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it was really hard for us to kind of identify what we're doing. The, the title was a little off for us, but I'm glad you're here. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, we're happy to have spoken to you. Uh, any questions? Well, thank you. Um, keep us in mind.